Hello, friends and adventurers. It's Rob, the D&D wannabe, coming in before the show to share some great news. New news! Our podcast has been supported for months now by Misty Mountain Gaming, and they're now rewarding you, our listeners, with savings on all their fine D&D products such as metal dice, stone dice, glass dice, miniatures, adventures, dice trays, and more. You can use the code TWINS10, that's T-W-I-N-S-1-0, to save 10% on all purchases made in their online store at MistyMountainGaming.com. Every code redeemed helps support Steven and I, and encourages us to make more and better content for you. So be sure to use code TWINS10 whenever you're buying premium Dungeons & Dragons dice and gear from our good friends at MistyMountainGaming.com. Okay, on with the show. Harry Gerald, they're gaining on us. I, uh, I know they're gaining. That's why I'm running. Uh, and my name is Gareth. Quickly, Gary, into that antechamber. Perhaps we can hide in there. Uh, 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 my, my, uh, that was a that was a close one. I dare say we might have met our end in glorious battle back there, Jerry. Well, we wouldn't have even had a battle if you just snuck past them, like I suggested. <sighs> Seriously, who sees a room full of zombies and reacts by saying, Ho there, and avast, you rapscallions! Step this way in an orderly fashion so that I might return you to the grave from whence you came. I'm not sure I appreciate your tone there, Jermaine. Gareth. But I cannot argue. I had no idea this menial fodder would be so difficult to kill. I would strike a mortal blow against one of my enemies, and it simply kept coming, as though entirely unbothered. Well, yeah, they're zombies. Seriously, do you not even know the first thing about adventuring? Oh god, this is awful. We still haven't rescued the princess. We haven't found the magic crown that'll help us defeat Gormonger. That and all my friends are probably dead by now. And Hold on there, Garrett. Gareth. Were you looking for a crown? Why, that chap over there seems to be wearing one. The putrid corpse sitting there on the large uh, chair. Oh, oh my. But, well, this is no antechamber. It's a throne room. So that means that that must be <gasps> the crowd of chaos. With that, we'll be able to turn the tides of this dungeon. But, but maybe even the whole war. I can defeat Gormonger and return a hero. Why, they'll rename the capital after me. Ooh, ah, yes, I Georgetown. I be able to marry the princess and become the future king. Of right. Course, we'll have to be Excellent. very careful retrieving I'll such a powerful artifact. I'll just pop over I mean, and nab it. doesn't it, seem I? to be guarded, but it stands to reason that it would be. Hmm. Given there's a lot of undead in this dungeon up till now, it stands to reason that there should be a powerful undead as the boss. So maybe that corpse over there may not be a corpse at all. Sir Tiddly, we should be very careful not to... Wait. Tiddly? Tiddly, where'd you go? Oh, look, Graham. This fellow isn't dead at all, and he's very friendly. He keeps trying to kiss my neck. Sir Tiddly, No! It's trying to bite you, not kiss you. That's a vampire. Oh? Oh. <laughs> ah! Certainly! Welcome back, friends and adventurers, to another episode of Bardic Twinspiration. I'm your host, Steven, joined, as always, by my twin brother, Rob. Hello, it's me, joining him. I just turned the camera on, and your hair is whacked. Yeah, dude, I, I'm, I'm relaxed, as relaxed can be. I've had to look a certain way all day, and I don't have to look a certain way for you, because um, I don't care what you think of me. So, yeah, mussy hair. Fair. 
more people should care less about what other people think of them. But yeah, thank you guys so much for coming back, tuning in for another week, as we get ready to talk about our favorite pastime, Dungeons and Dragons. And this time, we're doing something a little bit different. Yes, it's true. We've had plenty of episodes where we've covered various aspects of this hobby, whether it's how you should create your villain or how you should design your combat encounters, or maybe just some general advice for how to manage your table or your party. But in this one, we're stepping back behind the DM screen to talk about monsters, specifically those that have been done to death, or maybe beyond death, <laughs> perhaps into undeath. I'm pretty sure there's a joke in there somewhere, I just haven't figured out how to land it. Cheesy segue aside, we're going to be talking about the broad category that is undead in Dungeons & Dragons. That is a pretty wide net. Undead in D&D covers a lot. Undead feature heavily in the lore of Dungeons & Dragons and in real-world mythology and cultural history and in the media that we consume every day. In terms of D&D, they make warlock patrons, they make low-level enemies, high-level enemies, campaign villains, as well as sometimes potential allies when your party takes certain spells or your paladin chooses a particular subclass. Right. Human history, pop culture is just absolutely saturated with different types of undead. Whether you're talking about some of the original horror movies being Night of the Living Dead, whether you're talking about the genre-defining fiction that is Dracula and all the different things that have spun out from Dracula, such as the Castlevania series, which is now a game and also an animated series on Netflix, to even things like the Lord of the Rings. The first antagonists that we meet in the Lord of the Rings are these ring wraiths, which are absolutely undead and are one of the major hurdles that the Fellowship has to figure out how to circumvent in order to accomplish their mission. They're one of the longest running adversaries in that book series. Right, they crop up in The Return of the King as an army on Aragorn's side as he rides to the defense of Minas Tirith. They go from, even in The Lord of the Rings, from a low-level enemy to a high-level enemy-turned-ally. For a second there, I thought you were talking about the Ringwraiths being on Aragorn's side, and we were about to have words. <laughs> no, and are they even technically undead? I mean, they're they're just really long-lived, aren't they, thanks to the rings? You would know better than me. I, I, I would absolutely classify them as undead. All right, I'll ask Tarvel sometime. He'll know. Especially, like, comparing them to the monsters in D&D Beyond. If some of these things are undead, oh, they're absolutely undead. <laughs> but anyway, yes, undead pop up everywhere, not just in D&D. They pop up in fairy tales, in horror books and literature, obviously. Also, adventure and mystery and romance, thanks to Twilight and such as that, and sci-fi. They're everywhere. You can easily name, I'm sure, anyone listening, several examples of where a ghost or a zombie or a skeleton or a lich or the mummy pops up in some horror. I mean, not the least of which are the classic universal monsters. So it's pretty hard for me to imagine playing Dungeons & Dragons and not including undead somewhere at some point in the game. And as D&D &D has been growing over the past couple of years or even decades, the repertoire of monsters that it includes in the fiction has been growing along with it. So it's no surprise that D&D &D is positively saturated with various different types of undead. D&D &D now includes everything from skeletons to zombies to vampires and more. The undead in D&D &D also includes not only the things that have died and come back, but also the things that have somehow circumvented or transcended the concept of death. So it has become just a broader and broader category of some very cool and thematic creatures. To say nothing of the fact that you can take literally any monster in D&D, raise it from the dead a little bit wrong, and have it be an undead as well. Yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it, that undeath can be perceived both as a terrible, horrific curse in Dungeons & Dragons, and it can be seen as an escape, as a reward, something to seek and attain to access greater power, right? You have people who would bemoan being raised as a lowly zombie, 
and wizards who spend their entire academic lives searching for the secrets of lichdom, that they may outlive this mortal coil. On this point, I am by no means an expert on the Eberron campaign setting, but I know that there is a running theme of undeath with the elves in Eberron. I cannot remember where I heard this, and I cannot personally attest to it's true, but it's still a good concept either way, that there is a city somewhere in Eberron built by the elves that runs on electricity that is generated by a subterranean turbine that is kept constantly turning by undead zombies. Ha! I had not heard that before. <laughs> that is fun. Really? Okay, because I thought I had mentioned this a couple of times. So it's a considered part of life in this city. Oh, man, I wish I knew where I had heard this so I could cite the source or something. But when you die, your body is going to be repurposed. Nothing can be done about your soul. It's gone on to its resting place, but your body is just, you know, free real estate it's over here. too valuable a resource to waste. Right, so we're going to reuse this thing. It's basically like the entire culture is just made up of organ donors, and they're donating their body to power the city and perpetuate this elevated lifestyle that they have that supersedes all the other cities and cultures around them. That is just an incredibly practical view of life and death and bodies when you're in a magical world. I mean, isn't it, though? It's irreverent, but practical. Yeah, and well, they don't even see it as irreverent. That's what I'm saying, that it's like kind of like a cultural thing. And I also believe that there is a culture... In fact, I know of this, I just don't have a lot of details. There's a culture of the... Arini elves, which I, I'm sure I horribly mispronounced, <laughs> that are ruled by the Undying, which is considered to be the highest honor. You take a already incredibly long-lived race like elves, and then you allow certain members of them to transcend death through a ritual, it, which is not lichdom, but there are some similarities. You basically permit them to transition into a state of perpetual life and or undeath, and then they continue to govern the city. So it's just this recurring theme that death is not the end for this race of elves. They get a really long life, and then it keeps going one way or another. That is really interesting. You know, the Godfather and I have had a lot of discussions about the Forgotten Realms country of Thay, which has gotten a lot of mileage, the Red Wizards of Thay, in a lot of the D&D publications over the past few years. I'm glad that you brought these guys up because they immediately came to mind when we were talking about this episode, especially when I said that the perception of undeath is a cultural one, not necessarily a moral one in every setting. Right. It is a majocracy where the most powerful wizard and wizards are in charge, and obviously the guy that takes the cake on that was this guy named Zaz Tam, and Zaz Tam was a lich, and he had some very, uh, shall we call them, original views on life and death, given his particular circumstances. Yeah, I imagine he would have an opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> he has undead as his errand boys in the city. All the stuff that you don't have time to do in your day-to-day -day life, have an undead do it. Deliver a message, take a package across town, have an undead do it. They also defend their whole city with an army of undead. If you ever go attack they, it is very unlikely that any lives will be lost. Because you just have so many undead to deal with before you get to anyone actually living. And every guy you lose trying to invade their home is coming back, standing back up, and being turned against you and your boys. Right, yeah. No no Thay lives will be lost. Your, <laughs> your losses will be <laughs> catastrophic. Yeah. Thay will be fine. Uh, <laughs> pun <laughs> Thay pun will intended. Be, Thay will be fine. <laughs> They also, like, since they're so magically talented, nobody wants to piss off Thay. Because if you piss off Thay, they're going to just open a portal to the middle of your city and drop their troops in. And again, their troops are not going to be their powerful wizards. They're going to be entirely expendable undead. Right, so you have, on the one hand, no risk from the people of Thay, and they have yet everything to gain. Yeah, it's the undead are a perfect offense-defense combo if you have enough of them. I remember when you told me about this, when you explained the lore of what Thay is in the Forgotten Realms, I thought, why are these guys not in charge? 
and you told me that oh they've they've hand waved that because there's so much infighting amongst all of the mages in Thay. That's why they are yeah. confined to their own little country is because they can't all get behind a singular entity enough to have that guy just take over the world. Yeah, they're all just backbiting and trying to be the top of their own food chain because if they could get everybody else in Thay to follow them, they'd be unstoppable. But no one wants to be the lowest rung on the totem pole that rules the world. Thay to be unstoppable. Oh, uh, anyway, let's. Uh, we got to get away from the Thay jokes at some point. Yeah. This is a tangent, but can we just take a couple of seconds and recognize just how terrifying a necromancer is in combat? I know that it's not, like, the coolest subclass for a wizard school as a player character. No, because the spells you get to raise the dead kind of suck. Yeah, and you have to play the long game and be a mathematician to figure out how you can break the game with undead, which can be done, and a lot of people have done it, but it just doesn't seem to suit casual play. And what it does is it kind of eliminates casual play once you set your mind to it. Mm. But an NPC necromancer, especially, like, an army of necromancers like they have... Like they have, uh, like they like has. They have. <laughs> See, this is just going to get confusing. You're right. Is that the bodies on the battlefield are a constant resource. If someone kills your undead, you can raise your own undead. If your undead kills the enemy, you can raise the enemy. So your army, pardon the video game reference here, but your army just kind of snowballs once it gets started and it continually builds power with every encounter. It it do do that. And you know what? The quality of an individual undead can vary radically based on what you are raising and how you raise it. For example, a regular humanoid turned into a zombie, not the scariest thing in the world. A cyclops or a storm giant raised to undeath, physically terrifying with lots of hit points and unlikely to die and hits like a stinking truck. Yeah, you can have undead that range from infantry to one-man siege engine. Yeah, and if you raise them differently, for instance, just a normal humanoid, say you have a, a human wizard or a, a human-classed individual, you can raise them as a regular zombie where they are basically brainless and have none of their original talents. You can raise them as a revenant where they possess a burning vengeance in their hearts and have a few more abilities than your run-of-the-mill zombie. You can raise them as a lich, where they retain all of their previous power and then some. And this is a point that I really wanted to make. You are going to find undead at every level of play. If you wanted to play a campaign where your party was just undead hunters or ghostbusters, if you prefer, you could play that campaign with a lot of variety from 1st to 20th level, and there would be a challenge at every level just playing through Undead. And they suit all manner of campaigns, because as you pointed out, anything can become Undead. You can have Undead in any place where anything lives. Every town's got a graveyard. Every house has skeletons in their closet. Right. In, in the desert, you can find mummies. In the jungle... Skeletal T-Rexes, like in the Tomb of Annihilation campaign. You can have an undead death tyrant beholder in an Underdark adventure. Limitless possibilities. Right. And even if we were only talking about the original types of undead, and by original, I just mean the ones that aren't an undead version of something else. I'm talking about here our skeletons, our zombies, our ghosts, our banshees, our wraiths, our Bodax and our Demi Liches. Right. There is already a wide variety before you even step into the next level. The what if this, but not alive anymore and still dangerous. <laughs> I mean, that's basically where Draco Liches came from is what if dragon, but undead. Right. And Draco Liches are terrifying because of that. God, they're terrifying. Uh, and then they just applied that philosophy to something else with just about every book they've released after that. Um, <laughs> but going back to like the whole army thing too, even if we're not talking about an individual undead, the armies of the low-level undead types, say skeletons or zombies or things like that, are still just horrifically terrifying. Anytime that you have an encounter with an undead horde and a living horde, you're going to run into a couple of problems. To say nothing of, you know, what a necromancer can do in that situation. The problem with armies is that 
You have to feed them, and they have to rest. And undead have no such hang-ups. They don't need to eat. They don't need to sleep. Uh, they technically don't even need to breathe. So if you have to transport an undead army from this island to that mainland, and you're not a proficient magic user to be able to teleport them, as in they, they can just walk like it's the freaking Pirates of the Caribbean movie one. <laughs> and a couple of skeletons are walking in the sand along the bottom of the ocean. They can get where they need to be. There's not really any stopping them apart from disassembling them. I was going to make that reference if you didn't. They're the perfect siege army, too, because you cannot outlast them. Yeah. So let's go ahead and elaborate on that, then. Some of the stuff that make Undead special in general, but specifically in terms of playing Undead, running Undead, or facing Undead in Dungeons & Dragons. As you mentioned, they're dead. They have no need or desire to preserve their bodies any longer. They are sustained by magic, so they don't require air, food, water, or sleep, and don't get exhausted. You are never going to outrun an undead, right? You can hide, but you can't run. <laughs> they, are go they will catch you. Furthermore, they have no self-preservation instinct. By and large, what are you going to do to me? Kill me again? You know? <laughs> yeah, what do you do as a dungeon master? Do you say, do you, you, you kill the skeleton? <laughs> you know, you kill the zombie. They're, they're already dead, bro. I mean, like, if there is a wall of fire or swinging blades between an undead and you, it is not going to have to take that beat of, hmm, should I or should I not do this? Is this worth the risk? Like, nah, fam, let's go. I can kill you without an arm just fine. <laughs> it allows you to go full Zap Brannigan, too, where you can say, I sent wave after wave of my own men. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If you need to overload some kill bots, this, this is, is the way to do it. If you need to have them reach their preset kill limit <laughs> and shut down, undead is the tactic. So that's one way. They are basically unstoppable. And because of that, if they have bodies, and let's be clear, we're talking about corporeal undead right now. We will get to incorporeal undead like ghosts and poltergeists and wraiths. We'll get to that. Oh yeah, that's a whole nother thing. A whole nother empirically better thing. And by better, I mean more terrifying. Right. So with these corporeal undead, their physical body has already died. Again, they're not trying to preserve it. It has no upkeep. And it also is unaffected by things that affect normal bodies. You pump a bunch of poison into a deadite, you know, that's an evil dead thing, but still, <laughs> an undead creature, it doesn't care. It's not got a working circulatory system that it's going to be interrupted. Yeah, you stab it in the heart, so what? Exactly. It's not going to get poisoned. It's not going to get seasick. It can drink as much as it wants. It's never going to get drunk. And they're, for the most part, resistant or immune to necrotic damage. Because there's not a soul for it to affect, and there's not a body for... Or there is a body, but it doesn't care what happens to it for the necrotic damage to take purchase on. And so some of the ways that you might want to kill one of these things are not options for you anymore. And sometimes they're immune to a lot more than that. I remember thinking at one point that these low-level corporeal undeads are just kind of dull and boring. And I think the problem is that in the encounters where I encountered them there just weren't enough because mm -hmm. if you have enough of these things it can be just terrifyingly compelling they have seasons and seasons and seasons of the walking dead and they have one enemy type well humanoids as well i i, I, I think okay, if, fair enough. if you watch enough let's not talk about the walking dead too much but i think the real <laughs> scary thing in the walking dead is not the walkers it is the people the desperate people around them. Oh yeah, fair enough. That's what makes good zombie movies, is not the zombies, it's the people you thought were your friends. But you make a good point about there not being enough undead, and we are going to talk about that. I, it's so hard to stay on topic, there's so much I want to say. Well, before we move on from the army thing, let's just keep in mind that the other perk to having an undead horde is that they are pretty compliant for the person who raised them. Right. I mean, you, you basically get to drive an undead if you are the person that raised them. Very few types of undead have completely free will. And they're generally pretty high up there. Yeah, you don't have to deal with a lot of back talk <laughs> when your undead minion is jaw optional. <laughs> it's true. 
And and because of that, because their will is not their own, a lot of baser level undead, if they don't have someone controlling them, if the person controlling them dies, are basically just running on instinct. And again, they don't have that self-preservation instinct. They're just trying to feed themselves and kill things that are alive and propagate. So they can't really be charmed or frightened or dissuaded or persuaded away from the course of action that they are set to. They are a wind-up toy that never unwinds. And as you said, there are some very notable exceptions in terms of corporeal undead with intelligence, with plans, with strategies, with intent. Uh, And I know that we'll be circling back around to at least one of those later on, Mm. but those are often not just intelligent creatures. Those are quite often hyper-intelligent undead creatures because they now have not just the benefit of their years, they have the benefit of many times their years, and they're no longer bound by the limitations of their own lifespan. So now their machinations can take decades, if not centuries, to complete. When you encounter those, I often find them to be at least minor, if not major villains. Absolutely. And a lot of that starts because you don't become a high-level undead purely by accident. There are dark secrets, there are arcane rituals, there are fell bargains to be made to access that kind of power, and then... So you're already starting off at a higher playing field before you have the time. And you know the saying, like, Batman can beat anybody if he's given enough prep time. (laughs) Undead have all the damn prep time, okay? (laughs) And you usually don't go through that sort of trouble unless you already have some sort of plan, right? You just think, hmm, you know, I'm getting kind of old. I'll probably die in like five years. What if I didn't? (laughs) No, it's often, again, probably some sort of villain within your campaign that is trying to see their plan to fruition and realizing that it will take longer than they've got left. And so they turn to the only options they have left. Yeah, they're playing the long game to get an even longer game. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what's cool about the corporeal boys. But there are incorporeal ones as well, and they come with all the benefits that corporeal undead get, and then some. Some cherry on top things, like having no physical body. I mean, when you have no body to hit, you have no body to hit. Like, so many damage types just become not an option anymore. Right, the incorporeal undead fairly consistently have this incorporeal movement monster trait, which I think I can say confidently is my favorite monster trait. Yeah, there are some cooler ones that only apply to like one or two monsters or something like that, but as far as a feature that applies to a broad category of creatures, incorporeal movement is easily my favorite. Oh man, I mean, you basically get a fly speed, you get omnidirectional movement, You are no longer constricted by walls, floors, ceilings, gravity, other creatures, doors. Right, and you also gain immunity. I'm sorry, let me reemphasize that. You gain immunity from tons of conditions that can only affect someone who has a physical form. Things like exhausted, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, being knocked prone, being restrained. Yeah, and a lot of them can't be charmed or frightened, just like the corporeal boys. So it's almost the entire stinking list. Plus, there's the whole fact that they can attack through walls and floors and ceilings, which I feel like is just a big boost that is not actually, like, addressed within a stat block. The fact that you can attack someone without actually opening yourself up to them is a terrifying concept to be on the other side of. Right. You you can't be ready for it. You know, you can't put the fighter between the threat and the wizard if you can go through the fighter, if you can go underneath the fighter, if you can go over the fighter. Or straight up possess the wizard. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about possession. That's a whole other thing. The player characters have options and feats and class features that are going to give them all sorts of ways to attack things that they can see. But being able to pass through walls is basically giving you instant access to total cover whenever you need it. In addition to near-perfect movement, based on the fact that you can effectively teleport within your move speed to the other side of whoever is causing you the most problems to access whoever you need to, as you said with your example of the fighter and the wizard. 
It is, I mean, it's just good. I mean, undead are just good. Have we sold you on undead yet? Have, were you already sold on undead? If not, we will try further to persuade you. I submit to you the following reasons for why you should use undead in your Dungeons and Dragons campaign. First of all, they're straight up scary. Spooky, scary skeletons and shivers down your spine. If the reasons we were just listing are not enough to convince you that these things are a threat that need to be taken seriously, they are terrifying not just from a mechanical standpoint, but from a lore standpoint. These are the returned dead. Perhaps the dead of loved ones, perhaps of friends and neighbors or heroes, people that you respected. They're back and they're coming for you. If that isn't creepy, I don't know what is. So many cultures around the world have superstitions and practices to prevent the dead coming back, the dead from walking, because they are such a terrifying proposition to have to deal with. And besides that, even if your players are somehow immune, not their characters, if your players are somewhat immune to the creep factor that undead bring to your campaign, a lot of undead come with a frightening aura, or a dreadful glare, or a frightening presence, or a maddening glare, or something that is going to affect the way your player characters behave, and it makes them act suboptimally at best. Right, to your earlier point, take advantage of all of that lore and all of this saturation in pop culture. Use your player's experience with Undead and the baggage that they carry from that horror movie they saw as a kid, and turn that to your advantage at the table. Obviously, don't actually terrify someone if they have a thing about that. We've had some players who do. But use what they know about vampires to flavor your vampire villain. Take advantage of the whole gothic horror genre, and just sprinkle little influences here and there throughout the campaigns. Your players, whether or not they notice it, might pick up on a few of those things. You know, the house that I live in was sold to its previous owner, my landlord, because a widower did not want to stay in it any longer without his wife. His wife, sadly, passed away in one of the back rooms of my house, and I have been told by others who have stayed in my guest room that they hear a woman's voice in the evenings as they're falling asleep. I have some friends who don't want to stay at my house anymore because they genuinely believe that it is haunted. Hey, you've put me in that back room before when I stayed over. <laughs> <laughs> it's just little things like this. Just throwing something like that into your campaign can add an element of unease that just creeps out just a little bit. Are we going to have an encounter here? Should we stay here? Is it dangerous? Am I going to be all right? Am I going to be possessed? Am I going to attack the party? I don't know! Undead and the concept of undead is inherently unsettling. And, because I don't think I can wait to talk about this any longer, another benefit of undead, like you said, is that undead procreate. They propagate themselves. You are very rarely going to deal with a single undead. If you have a vampire, they're probably creating more vampires. If you have a wraith, they're going to kill and they're going to create more specters. If a shadow kills you, you're coming back as a shadow. If you've watched any zombie apocalypse movie, you know that a single bite is sufficient to turn you into another zombie. It is a death sentence. You will die, and when you do, you're coming back for your friends. Ironically, in basically any fantasy or sci-fi setting other than d and I know, it bothers me so much! Why don't zombies create more <laughs> zombies in D&D? I've literally... <sighs> hmm, someone should make a well-thought-out YouTube video on how to fix that problem. <laughs> because they took away the thing that was the most compelling you know... about the zombie movies and just neutered it right out of Dungeons and Dragons. Oh my god. Uh, thank you for mentioning I did do exactly that thing. There will be a link to that video in the description of this episode of the podcast. And I get salty. 
in that video. I am so mad that they took the thing that makes zombies scary away from zombies. Because finding a zombie in your town should be, I'm trying not to curse for emphasis, should be a real problem. And it's just not in D&D. But you can make that happen, and I can show you how. But even zombies aside, if you find an undead in your campaign, in your town, in your city, there's more. You just haven't found them yet. Undead are a plague. And finally, I know we mentioned this earlier, but the whole possession aspect, yeah, not a lot of incorporeal undead have this ability, but it's basically just an empirically better version of dominate person. Yeah. Which is, for my money, the scariest condition that I can be afflicted with as a player. It's one thing for me to go down, because then my team loses a teammate and someone has to pick me back up. It's another thing for me to die, because that has its whole other set of complications, but the teams still haven't changed that much. However, it is far more terrifying for me to be moved to the other person's team than to have to sit back and watch while the DM's in the driver's seat for my player character. While your teammates are wailing on you with all of their best stuff. Right, we've now removed a person from the party's team and added a person to the enemy's team, A significantly powerful person. Yeah, and it's not just possession that can have that effect. Say that your DM throws some different undead at you. Say she sends a wraith your way, or a shadow. When they reduce you to zero hit points, which they are very capable of doing, by the way, they don't just leave you there. They don't just kill you. You are standing back up as a specter, or as another shadow. And then, with all your new hit points as that creature, you're coming for the party on their team. Right. It just completely invalidates your death saving throws, and then, by and large, removes the possibility for you to be resurrected, while still adding more bad guys to the opposing team. Yeah, Matt Colville talks about this in his Undead video, which I very much recommend you watch, by the way, that fighting Undead can easily become a death spiral, where... Once you start losing, you start losing fast. It's not a situation of, oh no guys, we can still come back from this. It's, oh, Dave went down. Now Dave's a shadow and he's fighting us. So did Ted. Ted also went down. And now Susie's about to die. And it's going to be just me. And the enemy team is not getting smaller. It's getting bigger with every passing round. And you can find effects like this at very, very low challenge ratings. Oh, sure. What? What is a shadow? I feel compelled to look this up now. Challenge rating one half. One half for a shadow. And they already have that ability. They do. Of course, now you're not coming immediately back as a shadow. You're coming back an hour or two later. But that just means they're coming for you later in the dungeon. Or on your way out. Or when you're trying to have that long rest. Oh, yeah. Incorporeal undead are great. For keeping your party from resting. Just, you know. <laughs> hey, I don't get to rest. Neither do you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Just poke them through a wall with your incorporeal movement or something. It doesn't matter where they relocate to. You can follow them there. You can go through walls. You can go through ceilings. When you encounter an undead who is malicious and vindictive enough to follow you, you have to kill it with your current resources or less because you have no opportunity to get any back as long as it's around. That's one of the terrifying things about a revenant. If your party kills something who feels so strongly in their death that they need vengeance for what happened to them, that revenant is going to come after them. And even if you kill the body that it is coming in, that spirit is going to possess another dead body, and 24 hours it's coming back, and it's coming back, and it's coming back. Your party will never feel safe again. Oh, yeah. Hey, we haven't even talked about how a lot of undead have special conditions that must be met before they will permanently re-die again. Right. In your Lost Minds of Fandelver campaign, we came across a flame skull, Mm -hmm. a floating head on fire, Yep. and we killed it multiple times. (laughs) 
Yeah, I knew that was hard for you because I knew that as a dungeon master who owns the monster manual and has probably read it front to back more than once, you knew the gimmick to get rid of that flame skull, but everyone else, it was like their first or second time playing D&D and you didn't want to spoil it for them. <laughs> oh god, I thought, oh god, it can cast fireball and it's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had never cast Fireball before as a player, but then I got an opportunity to do so using the Flame Skull on your level 3 or 4 party. It was a lot. <laughs> it, it was a lot, and it came back and did it again. <laughs> um, and even, even though I knew the trick, I didn't have access to what I needed to stop this thing from coming back. We found a weird workaround, I think, after the second or third time. Yeah, I think in the stat block or in at least in the description underneath, it says that the flame skull will reassemble. So you just took pieces away yep. and carted them off so that it was incapable of fully reassembling. And I'm like, you know what? That sounds like it would work. So you know what? This is a level three party and they've been fireballed twice. Maybe we cut them some slack. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Anyway, yes. So they are resilient. They are tough to kill. Sometimes they don't stay that way. Even zombies, who we've been making fun of this entire time for being low level undead, difficult to kill when you reduce them to zero hit points they have a chance to just not just not die and that's to say nothing of the most famous example being liches with their phylacteries they can go full voldemort and doesn't matter what you do to them there are still phylacteries out there so they're just going to continue doing the same thing they do every night trying to take over the world <laughs> exactly and you know what if you fail to kill an undead oh boy it's like failing to kill a Rakshasa, or even sending a Rakshasa back to hell. This thing is going to come back, and it's going to visit its wrath, if not on you, on your children, and your children's children, and your children's children's children. You will never regret anything more than pissing off an immortal. But the good news is... You're probably going to want to kill these things, and you're probably going to have some help, and no one's going to care that you did. Is One of the reasons that Undead are great to throw into a campaign is they're pretty universally accepted as unholy abominations. If your players need a break from the moral complexity of, should we side with the Stormcloaks, or the Imperials, or are we really doing the right thing, or is the guy we're helping really a good guy, or is he kind of bad? You throw some undead at them, and they're going to know exactly what to do. Right, unless you're playing with some characters who are elves from Eberron or Red Wizards of Thay, they're probably not going to be big fans of the skeleton zombies, ghouls, mummies, and liches out there. I do know that certain players have a soft spot for vampires, and, uh... Yo. No, I mean, like, uh, like a Twilight version. Oh, no. For those people, uh, I can't help you. Hmm. But Dungeons & Dragons has certain character classes that are basically undead neutralizing machines. And it's probably no surprise to anyone how useful clerics and paladins and even certain types of rangers can be against this enemy type. Yeah, and that's another reason that you should definitely have undead in your game, right? Because if it's actually something of a joke that a lot of Dungeons & Dragons does not involve dragons. <laughs> and... If you don't have a dragon in your game, that's fine. People might be a little bit disappointed, but their characters are going to work perfectly well. On the other hand, if a cleric is in your campaign and you never face any undead, there's a whole class ability that they get that they're never going to be able to use. Just never going to come up. Right. They're never going to reach their full potential. They're never going to get their badass moment if you don't have undead turn up if you paid attention to critical role campaign one or if you watched the legends of vox machina and saw pike's moment around the sun tree in whitestone you know what kind of a badass your cleric can look like in a moment against a horde of undead in previous editions of DD, undead were much much scarier Oh, everything was. <laughs> I mean, fair. But encounters with undead would frequently involve losing stats or losing levels as penalties for being affected by their attacks. So having a cleric in your party used to be fairly mandatory because they were equipped to turn back the undead scourge. And that lives on in that turn undead player feature. And while undead have in many ways kind of lost their teeth, 
they are still incredibly powerful, especially when the DM properly uses the features that we've mentioned in this episode. And so having a cleric available to still use that throwback undead ability can really come in clutch. And it upgrades to become destroy undead. If you send a necromancer with a army of low-level undead at a cleric, the cleric gets to press the undo undead button, and now it's a solo fight against a necromancer, and you're going to have a much better time and really ruin that necromancer's day. It took me months to accrue this many undead. <laughs> I use only raise dead. <laughs> what's the... What's the spell players get to do this? I never take it because it sucks. <laughs> yeah, raise dead. Fifth level necromancy. That's why you never take it. <laughs> You've undone so much of my work. Yeah, I can, I can, I can do this a couple times a rest, actually. It's no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yes. Yeah, so clerics aren't reaching their full potential if they don't face undead. Paladins also get a boost to their smites if they're facing any kind of unholy abomination. Undead included. So, sure, if your campaign has fiends on the list, then they're still getting their money's worth out of their ability. But they can really shine against undead as well. Right. And finally, we mentioned rangers earlier. When you take the ranger class, you get to choose a favorite enemy. And depending on which options you're using, you can get some pretty neat advantages when you are tracking or attacking said favorite enemy. Have you ever seen the Hugh Jackman movie Van Helsing? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I would absolutely classify that version of Van Helsing as an undead specialist ranger. I could see that. I, I'd probably agree with you that that's, that's as close as you could come in D&D. And you say, oh, but rangers, if they pick any other kind of favorite enemy type, then they're all right. Well, you want them to be able to pick any kind of enemy type. And whichever one they pick, you want to make sure it turns up in the campaign. We talked about this a couple episodes ago. True. True. Now, before we go, because I do think that in the post-editing version of this podcast, we will have a couple of more minutes. Why don't we talk about some of our favorite undead and the things that we like best about them? Okay, sure. Shall I start? No, no. You came first in life. I will come first in all other ways. Okay. In one of the first campaigns that you ran for me, we had an encounter with a certain undead called an Alep, which I had never heard of before, and I've never seen in the campaign since. But I wonder why they aren't used more. And these are not one of my favorite undeads because of their abilities, which are cool, or because of the damage that they can throw out, which is absolutely not insignificant for a challenge rating 4. It is because they are essentially a plot device... On a stick. <laughs> on a incorporeal undead stick. They're the guys who learn some forbidden knowledge, and are the knowledge basically killed them, and they're trying to pass it on and kill others? Am I remembering right? Yes, they are. An Alep is created when a human discovers a secret that a powerful being has protected with a mighty curse, and that knowledge that they have attained in this way plagues them to insanity that lasts beyond the death of their physical body. Per the book, they are racked with horrifying insights that torments what remains of their mind. And the only relief that they can gain is to pass this terrifying knowledge, this secret, on to someone else. This sounds like such a Cthulhu entity. Doesn't it, though? Such an eldritch horror thing. I learned that we are all just specks in the cosmic. We are cosmic dust and there are creatures who live existences eons into infinity beyond our understanding in realms we cannot comprehend. And I just got to tell somebody real quick so that they can die and I can feel a moment's bliss. <laughs> well, you know what is really appealing to me is that I enjoy world building. Uh, and I've been doing it a lot on our Discord, as we mentioned in previous episodes. Uh, and if I have some spare time at work, then often what I'll do is jot down a few notes in the ongoing file that I've been curating. But one of the things that I've heard complained about by various dungeon masters is not to go too deep, not to go too high level with your planning because you're probably going to be wasting a lot of time building some secrets, building some lore about your world that your players are never going to practically encounter. Inserting an Alep into your game allows you to shortcut 
to the big, world-shattering secrets that make your world what it is. You can just skip to the good part. <laughs> yeah, the mechanics of the Whispers of Madness action that an Alex has... Whispers of Compulsion, in case you care about that. Oh, well, I'm looking at the Legacy version. Oh, okay. Really? They changed that? Oh, okay, anyway, never mind. The mechanics of the Alep are not nearly so significant. As you said, they're not insignificant, but they're not nearly so significant as having the opportunity to speak some truth into the lives of your player characters. You are correct. Alips are cool. And just to zoom through their stat block as to why they would actually make a good combat before they dropped a little secret that made it an even better encounter, they do have a 40-foot fly speed, they have stealth proficiency, they have resistance to basically all elemental damages, plus physical damage types that are not magical. They're outright immune to cold, necrotic, and poison. They have all of the benefits of incorporeal movement, which I do love me some incorporeal movement, uh, and all the immunities that come along with it. And even while they don't have a multi-attack feature, they are capable of attacking multiple creatures per round with some of their actions. I like how the new stat block for the Alep says unusual nature instead of undead nature. Yeah, they all do that now, post Mordenkainen's. That is... That is not... <laughs> what, what's wrong with having undead nature? It is the nature... Uh, We're probably going to find it on some other non-undead creature as we continue to go through the book. Wizards! It was fine! Leave it alone! I believe now it is time for one of yours. Okay, so we're going to start with shadows. You remember how you said that they really took the teeth out of undead, which I believe all vampires would find offensive, by the way? I almost made a joke about that. But I decided to go with the the sparkling twilight ones instead. Sure. Compared to previous editions, they've weakened them because they don't allow undead to attack levels or ability scores. Well, my friend, let me introduce you to this challenge rating one-half creature called a shadow. Ah, this is the one that we were discussing earlier. It is. It's this undead, quasi-corporeal creature that just looks like a shadow and could easily be mistaken for one. If it hides in an area of dim light or darkness, including your shadow, it is capable of hiding there and hiding pretty well for a low-level encounter. This really reminds me of those things from The Legend of Vox Machina. I don't think it was exactly a shadow, but they move in a very similar way, I believe. Yeah, they're stinking quick. They sadly are ground-bound and don't have incorporeal movement, because again, they're technically physical creatures, but they are amorphous. They can flatten themselves against anything and move through crevices like it's no bother. While they are beings of darkness and are vulnerable to radiant damage, they make up for it by being resistant or immune to pretty much everything else and are immune to all the conditions that you want them to be immune to. So they're actually pretty hard to deal with and pretty tough to beat. Those 16 hit points on these guys stretch a pretty long way. But where they really shine is their one attack they can make called Strength Drain. They hit you, and not only do you take 2d6 plus 2 damage at a low-level encounter, that's not a small amount, but they reduce the target's strength score by 1d4, anywhere between 1 and 4, which takes a plus 2 modifier away from whatever your strength score is. Your 16 strength barbarian is going to start taking negatives to their attack rolls and their damage rolls after only a hit or two from a shadow much less a crowd of shadows attacking the party. And worse yet, if any ability score reaches zero, that creature dies. You don't have to deal with any other line of defense. You attack the wizard, who probably dumped their strength ability score like any sane wizard player would do. Mm -hmm. They're toast. These things are scary. And the moment your party realizes that their paladin, their fighter... Maybe their mace-wielding cleric, their barbarian, is going to be useless quick in a fight like this. Let alone the fact that they're going to come back if the shadow kills them. They might not know that going in. Maybe they make a religion or an arcana roll to know what will happen to them if one of these things kills them. They should run. This is not a fight you want to risk going against you. 
I love these creatures. And with good reason. The next creature that I had on my list was actually a named monster, which I really kind of wanted to avoid for actually what I'm realizing is completely arbitrary reasons. <laughs> Looking over this stat block, it is basically an Alip without the lore drop mechanic that I was so enamored with. Uh, but it is called Shimsheim, and it is from Candlekeep Mysteries. This is going to be news to me because I because Candlekeep Mysteries is an adventure, and I don't read the adventures nearly as closely as I read the manuals. So tell me about Shimsheim. Well, like I said, it's actually very similar to an Alep. Some of the numbers have been changed, but its three actions are the same as the three actions of an Alep, and it maintains incorporeal movement, and it has all of the same immunities and all of the same resistances, and even the same proficiencies, again, with different numbers. Hey, you just picked the same monster twice in a row. Yeah, but what makes Shimsheim so much fun is this one little feature that it has written here called Crushing End, which says if damage reduces Shimsheim to zero hit points, Shimsheim instead drops to one hit point, unless the damage is the result of Shimsheim being crushed by an object weighing at least 1,000 pounds which is just such a specific qualification to meet. Not only do you have to engineer a situation where you can crush this creature with an extremely heavy object, that attack specifically has to kill him. Because if it leaves him with at least one hit point, this whole process starts over again. So you're saying that your mother would have to shit on him, Trebek. I didn't say it was a good joke. Oh, wait, your mother is my mother. Ah! No, that that is so strangely specific. It's, I hope the adventure gives your party a way to figure that out, because that's not occurring to me. It does, it does. And, you know, like I said, incorporeal movement is my favorite feature that is applied to a broad variety of creatures within the monster manual and its associated tomes. But, like I said, sometimes just a monster will have something that is unique to it that is just so enticing, and this is one of those. I'm not sure that that is different enough to qualify as it being a different monster, but uh, that is just probably the most unique singular traits that I have ever seen written in something produced by Wizards of the Coast. No, it's not having to go and destroy a phylactery or something like that, but that even as hard as it can be to find a phylactery and deal with it, this somehow, to me, seems like an even harder situation to engineer. Yeah, this is an immediate problem, and it means you have to adventure in a place that has a thousand pound item or object in it, or you've got to bring one with you, which sounds incredibly inconvenient. The only way that I can see to do this reliably is to trigger this ability, enabling it to continue on at least once, and then attempt to crush it. But realizing that it has this condition is going to involve at least one combat where you have no idea what's going on and then have to figure out the problem and then you have to go and get the thousand pound object. If you survive the encounter. So there is just, I cannot imagine a scenario where you come up against Shimsheim and beat him in the first or second encounter. So uh, you mentioned liking things that make monsters unique and that's certainly one. You know what else makes monsters unique? Mummy rot. Let's talk briefly about the Mummy Lord. And I picked the Mummy Lord just because it's the mummy, but the Lord. <laughs> it's got legendary actions, baby. It's got rejuvenation and magic resistance, vulnerability to fire, but immunity to a lot of other stuff and condition immunities like you would want. We've talked about those things already. And you know what? Legendary actions... Legendary creatures get them. Lair actions, legendary creatures get them. Not going to talk about those. Let's zero in on why I think mummies going against your D&D party should scare them the most. Let's do that. Why would that scare them the most? It's not the spells. It's not that it's coming back after 24 hours if you fail to destroy the heart. It's not the dreadful glare that can make your party become frightened of it. It's just if this thing manages to put its well-bandaged fingers on your player characters. If you take a hit 
from The Mummy Lord's Rotting Fist, which deals a whopping 66 damage, by the way, not an insignificant amount. If that target is a creature, which your player characters definitely will be, then they must make a constitution saving throw or be afflicted by mummy rot. 66 is a problem. You just took that, and you have the potential to take it again. But if you fail that saving throw, the recipient of that rotting fist can no longer regain hit points. Hmm. That's bad, Steve. Uh, may I say, that is not a good thing for your party. Hmm, how long does that last? Uh, until it is removed by the remove curse spell or other magic. That's interesting, because it's effectively reducing your maximum hit points to whatever they are at any given point. Correct. And, you know what? If your party comes against a mummy uninformed, or fails some knowledge rolls to know what's going on, you're not obliged to tell them that they can't regain hit points until they try to heal that party member, until they try to take a short or long rest. And then, oh no, I wasn't healed. How unfortunate. How unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> And not only did they not heal, but every 24 hours that elapse before this curse is removed. Ah, curse. They take an additional 3d6 damage. Every day, until your player characters figure this one out, they are dying. And dying quickly. And that's if they survive the encounter with the Mummy Lord at all. Which it's a powerful badass. They're not necessarily guaranteed to do. And when they walk away with their very few hit points remaining, they start dying. And they keep dying. And they're not getting any better. Do we have time to figure this out? Do we have anyone in the party that can cast Remove Curse? Is there someone, an NPC that we know that can cast this spell for us? How far are they away? Do we have time to make it? Right. And let's say that you have a cleric in the party and who has access to that spell. Did they prepare it today? Because if they didn't, you'll have to wait until after the next long rest in order for them to prepare it. And when they do, that's another 3d6 coming your way. Exactly. And even worse, what if multiple members of your party contract mummy rot? What if your cleric only has so many spell slots? Who's risking that extra day? And furthermore, if you die to mummy rot, you don't leave a body for them to revivify or raise dead on later. No, you crumble to dust. Ooh, I feel like we should have led with that. <laughs> it's bad, man. I mean, the clerics always decide who lives and who dies, but this is taking that to a whole new level. So, and if your cleric is the one that contracted mummy rot, Lord help you. So... Mummy lords are awesome, and mummy lords suck, depending on your perspective. Go ahead and let the cleric attend their own funeral. It's just a matter of time before they end up in that coffin. I'm thinking of that Futurama episode where Bender fakes his funeral and then decides to live based on how much his funeral would suck. I have forgotten that one. That is fine. Let's just each do one more. What's your last favorite undead? Oh, I only get one more. Okay, okay. Uh, in that case, I think I know the one I'm going to have to go with. Now... I intentionally tried to stay away from the very top of the list because I wanted to pick out a couple of monsters that could conceivably be used in a low to mid-level campaign. And I wanted one that stood out to me, something that I wanted to run, like I did with the Alep. And so for that reason, I chose the Sword Wraith Commander. I love the Sword Wraith Commander! Yeah, he's really cool, and I'm going to tell our listeners why. Now, the version that I'm reading is not the one that came out in... Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, it's from the new Mordenkainen's book. Mm, reprints. Let's go ahead and dive in, shall we? It is a corporeal undead, which is strange for me, because I typically tend to like the incorporeal versions, but I'm going to make an exception for this guy. The Sword Wraith Commander is the risen spirit of a fallen soldier who felt that his task was incomplete. And for that reason, he has an armor class of 18, because he is here, reincarnated, still wearing his breastplate and holding his shield. He's got a solid 127 hit points and the usual resistances to non-magical attacks, which further pad that number, if you ask me. Notably, he has a fairly unique feature called Turning Defiance. The commander and any other sword wraiths within 30 feet of him have advantage on saving throws against being turned, say, by the cleric's effect. 
So, while a cleric is normally the anti-undead member of your party, a sword wraith commander is the anti-cleric member of the undead. Very few undead party members don't worry, guys, I got this, watch this. They walk up and use their turn undead, and uh, nobody runs. And it, the cleric is out there alone in front, and it's all snap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, the comedy that will occur right before the cleric goes down. Because the Sword Wraith Commander has multi-attack. And he can use this to make some fairly basic maneuvers using his long sword or his long bow. But in addition to that, he also has a bonus action called Martial Fury, which allows him to make an additional attack with either of those weapons, which deals an additional 2d8 necrotic damage. So they basically decide that they get an extra attack from what they were already given, and they make this one with three times the damage. Yes, although it does have a disadvantage. It kind of follows the reckless attack rules where in order to make this attack, he has to offer advantage to anyone who attacks him for the next round. But while the barbarian does this in exchange for getting advantage on attack, he does it to get an extra attack, which is empirically better. So move over, barbarians. This is the Sword Wraith Commander. But the best feature of the Sword Wraith Commander is called Call to Honor, which it can only do once per day. But once it has been wounded, it then gives itself advantage on all attack rolls until the end of its next turn. Including the bonus action one that it gets with Martial Fury. And in addition to that, it also summons 1d4 plus 1 Sword Wraith Warriors in unoccupied spaces within 30 feet. Those warriors last until they drop to zero hit points and take their turns immediately following the commander's turn. That That is kind of a sleeper detail there. It means that your entire enemy army can act in unison. It allows them to focus without your party having any chance to interrupt whatever they're setting up. Right. You hit the Sword Wraith commander, that's fine. That's to its advantage. You hit the Sword Wraith Commander at your own risk. Once it has taken damage, it can then, at any point from then on, once for the rest of the day, decide that it wants advantage on all of its attacks for the next round, and then automatically expending no resources other than this feature have slightly less effective, just just slightly less effective, versions of itself appear and remain in the combat until slain. These are no mere apparitions that are going to go away when you take out the commander. They're going to last. They're in it to win it. And they follow his action immediately, meaning that there is zero opportunity to react. And wonderfully, you probably didn't encounter the Sword Wraith commander alone in the first place. They were probably there with a few troops, just as you set up the encounter. And then they're getting these additional guys on top of that. So yeah... Sword Wraith Manders. Terrifying. Reinforcements have arrived. But perhaps not as terrifying as my final choice. And I I dithered about which undead to pick as my third choice for this. Perhaps I would go with Bodak with its aura of annihilation that just kills things by casually walking by. Or the Nightwalker, who does basically the same thing but at a higher level, so like worse... Nightwalkers almost made my list. Yes. Also, the Revenant, who is an unstoppable juggernaut of revenge coming at you with basically no hope of ever escaping its vengeance. You're dealing with that to the day you die, and it already has. But anyone who knows me well could probably predict that my final undead had to be vampires. Team Edward? No, bro. Ah, uh, Team Jacob. Yeah, I knew you were a class act. I read Dracula annually. I have more copies of Dracula in my house than any other book. I think there are four copies of the same book in my house right now. And I actually have read every copy that I own. I own a big copy with notes about what the author might have meant in particular passages because vampires are not only cool, not only sexy, not only terrifying, but incredibly effective villains. Yes, 
well, let's get the basics out of the way. They're resistant to things that you would want them to be resistant to. And you know what? They have vulnerabilities that other undead don't. They have to live by arbitrary rules that Bram Stoker set up for them years ago that the writers of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons wanted to preserve in their newest incarnations. But they are one of the few undead with the ability to shape change. They're one of the few undead that... When they're reduced to zero hit points, they fly away. They escape in a puff of smoke, really a cloud of mist. They're one of the few undead, besides the Sword Wraith Commander, who can summon agents, children of the night, to themselves. They're one of the few undead who can regenerate every round after they've taken damage. And they're one of the few undead, they don't have incorporeal movement, but they can climb on ceilings and on walls and attack from unexpected angles. They have legendary actions in their standard suite of abilities. They are just that cool. You were talking about how possession is one of the worst things that can happen to a player character. They can charm any humanoid that they are interested in turning against their enemies, making into their personal friend and everyone else's enemy. And every time they take a nibble of a succulent neck of a member of your party, they reduce the maximum hit points of the creature they have hit with the damage from that bite. They put a ticking clock on how much time you have to beat them, because every time they deal damage, it is irreversible. And if you die, you are becoming a vampire. And you are not becoming a cool, sexy vampire with your own free will. No. You are becoming a slave of the vampire that killed you. Right. You would come back as a CR5 vampire spawn, which is just the the least cool, worst kind of yes. vampire. <laughs> you could kill by Drac and come back as Edward, baby. I mean, not even. These guys are <laughs> incredible. And this is just the basic vampire. They have stat blocks for the Vampire Spellcaster, the Vampire Warrior, to say nothing of Strahd von Zarovich, the coup de gras, the creme de la creme of vampires, who really could use a little more love in his stat block, but we're not going to talk about that here, who is both a talented spellcaster and accomplished warrior and tactician. These guys have been around. They've seen it all. You're not going to surprise them like you were talking about with liches and other immortal undead creatures. These things are intelligent. They are charming. They are magically empowered. They are seductive. And they are going to win. It's just a matter of time. I love vampires. Right. Actually, when I said those things earlier about having the benefit of multiple lifetimes and being hyper-intelligent strategists, vampires were what came to mind. They're, they're so good. Oh, man. They are probably the most recognizable and thematic undead, even over zombies and skeletons and things. As soon as a kid has their first Halloween, they know what to expect from vampires, and D&D keeps a lot of that true to the original source material, even adding in some vampire weaknesses to make sure that things stay on brand. But even if you don't go all the way up to the real deal CR-13 vampire, much less the named ones like Strahd, some of the smaller, weaker versions are actually still very powerful and have some fun and unique abilities. I'm thinking of the ones that were introduced in Ravnica. The Demir and Orzov both had one represented there, namely the Mind Drinker Vampire and the Blood Drinker Vampire, who, if they have bitten you, can read your mind or magically exert influence over their victims. I really think some extra thought could have gone into the Blood Drinker Vampire, by the way. I just think that is so redundant. Oh. You don't think that that was just, like, the perfect name for that vampire? <laughs> I'm trying to come up with a appropriately sarcastic simile. Oh, what? You what? I mean, I mean, he drinks blood, so it makes sense, right? You're not going to call him, like, the water-drinking vampire. Although that probably would be more... Or, although right, that would if, probably look, help a, to differentiate him more. Hey, if there was a water-drinking vampire, I think you should call it the water-drinking vampire, okay? If there was a multi-headed hydra... 
I think you should just call it a hydra. If there's a blood-drinking vampire, I think you should just call it a vampire. If there's an undead skeleton, I think you should just call it a skeleton, okay? We don't have to state the obvious here, is all I'm saying. (laughs) It is a little bit on the nose, I'll give you that. But I'm not going to criticize anything from Orzov too much because uh, I, I, I'm, I'm an MTG stan and Orzov's my colors, man. <laughs> so that's kind of a brief introduction to Undead. If you haven't used them in 5th edition yet, I frankly, I'm surprised. But if you haven't understood why they are cool or why you should use them more or what makes them special compared to other types of enemies in Dungeons & Dragons, this is a little bit on why and... Clearly, it's something that we're excited about. I think I would dare say I am passionate about including undead in your games. And I, we actually talked in a Session Zero episode about the fact that I once ran for someone who had a pathological fear of undead and how I modified my game to be welcoming of that person and to respect their fear and not include undead in my game but what we didn't talk about in that session was just how much of the monster manual that closed for me and how i really had to go outside of my rolodex of monsters to find other things to fill in because i like undead i use them a lot right just based off of what we have currently unlocked in D&D Beyond, there are over 200 unique stat blocks for just undead. I actually counted them earlier today for a YouTube video that I'm working on. And while there are, what did we say, 14 different types of monsters, more than their fair share are undead. Yeah, have you ever sat down and done the math on that? No, I'm sure you have. (laughs) Because I have, literally just now. Now, you recently looked up how many unique stat blocks currently exist on D&D Beyond. Yes. I'm doing a YouTube video on modifying monsters and creating original monsters for D&D, and I was amazed that I was still finding the need to create my own when there are 2,452 options listed on D&D Beyond right now. Just a staggering number. And then there are 14 different monster types. If I had types. a dollar for every monster on D&D Beyond right now, I'd have 2,450 dollars. And if I had a dollar for every <laughs> type of monster on D&D Beyond right now, I would have $14. So one would assume that, you know, the good people at Wizards of the Coast probably divided up these 2,452 monsters evenly amongst all the types to add as much variety as possible to the game that they've created, right? One might assume. Mm. (laughs) Correctly! Yeah, so when we started talking about this, you mentioned that humanoids make up a staggering percentage of that number because every time they write a new NPC for one of their modules or adventures, they have to give them their own stat block. Oh, God, yes. So many. So many of them are humanoid. An unfair number. To say nothing of the fact that you should expect to have a lot of generic humanoid enemies for each race that is represented in Dungeons & Dragons or for each profession or character class that they are attempting to replicate in Dungeons & Dragons. Sure. Veterans, bandits, town guards, abjurers, enchanters, and the like. There's priests, war mages, everything. Etc., 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 and then you add in all the different races and things. Like, you know, well, because humanoids encompasses all of the goblinoids. Yep. Which is a huge set, and every variation within the goblinoids that has ever been printed. 776 humanoid stat blocks, which is a staggering 31.3% of the stat blocks on D&D Beyond right now are humanoids. So, of the remaining... 68.7 possible percent to divide up amongst the remaining 13 categories of monsters. A full 8.2% is undead. Meaning that of the non-humanoid creatures on D&D Beyond amongst the 13 remaining categories, a full 12% is undead. That That is an unfair share. And, you know, granted, I don't think that they're going to give plants a fair shake. 
There's not gonna be that many plant monsters out there in the world, okay? Uh, and there's probably not that many oozes. You know, don't overlook yeah. those oozes because they have some good ones in there. But I definitely see your point. And you've got to have a lot of beasts out there too, right? You got to count from everything from spiders to hawks to octopi to dinosaurs. So the fact that they put such an emphasis on undead as a monster type shows that the people making the game agree that this is something to not miss. This is something to include in your campaigns, and this is something that matters in terms of storytelling, in terms of challenge, and in terms of making your characters care about and fear the monsters they are fighting. And with multiple hundreds of entries under this category, I think it's safe to assume that Wizards of the Coast doesn't want you to just continually reuse the same tried and true undead monsters game after game that your players have probably already encountered at other tables before. Add some variety. Go look through the tomes and peruse the repertoire and find something unique that they probably haven't encountered before. The next time you're looking for something to throw at your low-level party, don't just send in a ghost or a banshee. Grab a shimshime. <laughs> Mix things up a little bit. So those are some of our favorite undead creatures and why we think they're so great. What are some of your favorites? What are your go-to undead? Have you homebrewed any that you really think we should know about? Because I have, and uh, I'd like to talk about them. Whatever your answers may be, there's no better place to share them with us than our Discord. We have a growing community there. Steve is homebrewing stuff all the time. And the link to it is down in the description of this episode. Speaking of this episode, how did you feel about it? Did you find this entertaining, informative? Would you like to have us really drill into the topic of undead and make some recommendations for things that you can throw against parties of low, mid, and high tier play? Or would you like us to recommend some greatest hits from the list of undead or some obscure picks that you may not have thought about trying before? Would you rather us focus on a different monster type? I really want to talk about aberrations, just saying. Yeah, there's a lot of good aberrations out there. And then just earlier this year, Wizards released a whole book on the different types of dragons that you could add to your encounters, mm -hmm. expanding it even further. So there's a lot of other types of monsters we could discuss as well. If you'd like to let us know how you feel about this episode, if you would like to tell us that you'd want them to continue, or maybe change the format and direction that they go, you can find us on Facebook at Bardic to Inspiration and on Twitter at B to Inspiration. As you heard at the beginning of the episode, guys, this episode and all episodes of this podcast are brought to you by my wonderful employers over at MistyMountainGaming.com. If you love D&D and D&D products, or maybe just need some cool dice or some great minis for undead creatures to present to your party, Misty Mountain Gaming is the place to go. And you can save 10% on every purchase you make at their website by using the coupon code TWINS10. T W I N S 10 at checkout. Every penny you save goes directly towards supporting this show and the wonderful twins that make it happen. Yeah, that's right. And by the way, did we mention that when you order Misty Mountain Gaming, you're ordering from the same company that supplied the dice that Robbie Damon used on the set of Critical Role? Ah, yes, the Blue Cat's Eye set. We gave those to him at one of our conventions this year, and he was enamored. Yes, you too can roll the same dice that Robbie Damon of Critical Role fame, Ooh, has, Critical Role fame. has rolled on camera. On camera. Live. <laughs> In all honesty, uh, I can see why you gave those to him, because you wanted a dice that was for a man of class and taste, which I believe that he is, and those dice certainly fit the bill. Hey, Rob. Hey. You think you think anyone's, anyone's still hanging out after all that? No one's checked out. You think anyone, uh, or do you think they all checked out while we were saying the uh, social media stuff? I don't know. They still might be waiting for the bloopers after the, the, the end of the episode. Well, for those listeners who do, we just wanted to take a second and thank you for your continued listenership. Bardic Twinspiration is fast approaching its one-year anniversary. I don't have one of those little, like, birthday things to blow. Maybe I'll find that sound effect. If I do, insert it here. <laughs> No, that's not the one. Yeah, we've been we've been cracking at this for about a year, and you know what? We've had a great time. 
And those of you who have been listening, those of you who have joined the Discord and interact with us on a day-to-day basis have really been an encouragement and a source of motivation to continue doing this. Something that we love and frankly are just doing kind of as a passion project because we like talking about this game and we'd be talking about this game even if the mics weren't on and nobody was listening. But we felt almost a year ago that maybe we had something to share and that maybe someone out there would enjoy listening to what we had to say. And if that's you, genuinely thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We really do appreciate all of you. We've been working on this for over a year now, and by the time this episode releases, it'll be just a few short weeks until the anniversary of the first episode's release. And to show that appreciation, we're going to be trying some new things in the coming year to hopefully make it a little bit more entertaining for you. Things that are certainly going to really shake some stuff up for us, but uh, it's things that we're excited about. Right. Famously, it was said, If you take no risks, you will suffer no defeats. But if you take no risks, you will win no victories. Oh, sorry, that was a bad Futurama version of Richard Nixon uh, impression. Richard Nixon said that. Or from the newly released Chippendale Rescue Rangers movie, the biggest risk is taking no risk at all. Ooh, that's got to be Chip, right? Uh, it, well, it's both of them eventually but it does start out with chip yes <laughs> anyway it's going to be a little bit of an experiment and we're going to try some new formats we're going to try and bring some new people to the podcast we have our tried and true formula and we really enjoy talking about D with one another and we're not going to stop doing that oh we can't stop doing that <laughs> like mike's off or on, mike's on or off we can't stop doing that but as with every episode we would really appreciate your feedback on what's working for you and what's not and we've already talked about the best ways for you to communicate your feelings about this podcast to us so don't neglect to use them we do pay attention to your responses and we're looking forward to spending another year with you here on bardic Bardic inspiration see you soon The outro music you're listening to right now is called Mega Epic, and the intro music is called Super Epic. Both were composed by the wonderfully talented Alexander Nakarada and utilized under a Creative Commons license. If you enjoyed our content, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and review on your listening app of choice. To keep up with us on social media, look us up on facebook.com forward slash bardic twinspiration and on Twitter at btwinspiration. Want to interact with us directly? Come join our Discord. After all, who are we if not people who are willing to roll the dice on making some new friends? Links in the description. Come check it out. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. Recording. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm just recording. With, uh, without the Without the tune. <laughs> Our flesh golems and stuff. Yeah, our, yes, our flesh, flesh golems, golems are. You see, to. I mean, I think. Well, actually, that's a good point. Because I kind of feel like, like they. W- I didn't see them when I was going through. They could be. They're considered a construct. That's bullshit. <laughs> Grievances. <laughs> Grievances, indeed. Uh, I'm gonna try and make gonna a note say here. About... That's already gonna be bloopers. <laughs> We're fine. I was going to say something about Frankenstein, but I can't say anything about Frankenstein. He's totally undead. I don't care. That can only affect someone who has a physical form. Things like exhausted, grappled, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, being knocked prone, being grappled. I already said grappled. Being restrained. Right. uh, Famously, in your Lost Minds of Phandelver campaign, we met a Demi-Lich. Nope. That is false. (laughs) Oh, sorry, we met a flinch Right, and, and I don't are, think anything in, about my Lost Minds of Phandelver campaign was famous. Uh. Even zombies have their... They do, don't they? Hang on. Yes. Is that, uh, is a, that zombie, a mic thing? Um, no, no, zombies really do have... You, you, they have to roll a d6 or something when they die. Let me see, I'll look it up exactly. Yeah, they have undead fortitude. They, it's a constitution saving throw. Which says, if damage reduces shim Which says, if damage reduces shimshime. 
Well, this is one that I've never actually encountered or used, but I would really like to sometime. And I tried to stay away from the very tip top of the list, right? I wanted to come up with a couple of undead creatures that would conceivably come up in a low to mid-level campaign. And I picked one that I was particularly fascinated with and would love to use at some point. From Morden kind of some of those, was it? Volo. Well, Volo's was the original, but it was reprinted, I think, in Morden Cannons. Oh, I'm sorry. Morden Cain's Tome of Foes is, is the Sword Wraith Commander, just straight up, sorry. There's a legacy... Yeah, sorry. Morden Cain presents Monsters of the Multiverse is the reprint. Morden Cain's right. Tome of Foes is the OG. I'm sorry. I, make, I get um. things wrong about D&D sometimes. If you have a Wraith, they're going to kill, and they're going to create more specters. If you have a shadow... Gas create ghouls too, right? I thought about that, and I it does not say that in its stat block, which upsets me. They command ghouls. Are they just a ghoul variant? Apparently. Well, then they... Well, if, if ghouls create ghouls, then... I looked that up. It doesn't say that either. I really genuinely thought that. Weird misnomer. Yep. Yep. Ghouls. Ghouls turn into ghouls. Or ghouls victims turn into ghouls. Okay. According to, according to Forgotten Realms fandom, it says that... A a ghoul who is, or a humanoid who is bitten but not consumed by a ghoul will be infected by ghoul fever. And then will, if and when they die of it, they will inevitably rise as ghouls themselves the following midnight. Let's see what it says in 5e here. Unless preventative measures were taken by a cleric. Ghouls would still have all the skills and powers it had in life. It would just be warped, turning them into feral yet cunning and craving human flesh. Yeah, that's not reflected in the ghoul stat block or blurb in 5e. Yeah, uh, shame that. I mean, so we can t- we can talk about that too and say, you know what, they did the same thing to fucking ghouls. It is, it is saying that in the 5e fandom, but, you know, fandom is run by... Not Wizards of the Coast. Not Wizards of the Coast. Ghouls are pretty neat, though, because they're still supposed to be kind of sentient. Yeah. That's. I think they're going to primarily comprise the the undead nation in my setting. Do you want to talk about that, or do you want to move on? No, let's move on. All right. Now, you recently looked up how many unique stat blocks currently exist on D&D Beyond. Yes, researching a, mu- a music video? Bet. <laughs> I'm doing a YouTube video. <laughs> you weren't kidding. Yeah, I, I know some <laughs> dude. <laughs> you weren't kidding I don't, about I humans. can't tell you about okay. parenting, about children. All I right. can tell you about D&D monsters. 